I think we're cooking now. We are live. There we are. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a career development panel, which I think actually works out pretty well, considering the topics they just kind of finishing up with yeah. on yeah. The, uh, the last one. So uh, we'll do some quick introductions before we get going. Uh, I am Mike Jungluth, senior animator at BioWare. With me is... I am John Paul Reinmiller. I am a lead Cinemax animator at Vicarious Visions. Hi, I'm Adriana Puciano. I'm a senior animator at Rocksteady. And I'm Tasha Sonart. I am a associate creative director at Pixar. And um, I started in animation, though, so that's how yeah. I that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and so the, the big point of this uh, panel, this conversation, is that um, it seems like uh, a lot of times uh, when people get into animation, when they learn animation in school and early in their career, everyone is, is hyper-focused on uh, how do I develop my animation skills uh, and, and become a better animator, right? Um, and then usually after about a couple of two, three, four years, people go, how do I become a senior? How do I move towards this direction? How, and there really isn't a whole lot of training for this at a lot of studios. Um, a lot of the times it isn't something that's uh, even talked about because everyone's usually really excited to show the newest thing they've worked on. And uh, there isn't enough of this sort of talk on, on how to grow your, your whole career, right? And, and where to go with it. So um, that's what we're gonna do. And it's gonna be really open and casual. Uh, feel free to toss us questions uh, at any point. Uh, and we'll, we'll uh, talk about them. Um, we have four main topics that we're gonna cover. Each of us is gonna own sort of the, the conversation of each, but we'll all chime in and again, like uh, I've got the chat up here. I'll try to look at it. If I miss it, we have people uh, moderating the chat that'll throw the paper airplanes much better than I am, hopefully, yeah. uh, and, and give us uh, your questions. So uh, without further ado, I think we're gonna start with Tasha. Yeah, so I'm going to start with talking about career track advancement. And um, I am going to go into a little bit of my job history, and hopefully you guys can learn something from my experience. <laughs> um, but you guys feel free to chime in, too, if yeah, you of have course. relevant uh, comments. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit by talking about a book that I read that I think is really interesting and it's a book called outliers by malcolm gladwell and he talks a lot about um successful people and what makes them successful and some of that is luck but i think one of the things that he points out in the book that kind of stuck with me is that it's also about taking advantage of opportunities that either land in your lap or are just you know that you know come your way so um and i think that Part of the reason that that I've uh, been able to grow my career the way I have is is a combination of those two things. Of, of um, I was lucky enough to kind of be born at the right time of being going to college at Cal Arts when Toy Story just came out and it was sort of the beginning of computer animation. So in that way, I feel really lucky that I was sort of like on the forefront of that. Um, but also. Um, I didn't, coming out of school, I didn't actually plan to be an animator. I, I um, was thinking about going into story, but then when Pixar offered me an internship in animation, I was like, yes, I'm going to take that opportunity, even though the company was less known at the time. I know it's kind of hard to imagine there was a time when nobody knew what Pixar was. <laughs> but, um, but also, a lot of my classmates, um, we all did hand-drawn animation at the time. And so a lot of people were kind of reluctant to even work on the computer, but um, I was up for the uh, the challenge of it and the adventure. And I think that uh, that openness to trying something different that I hadn't necessarily planned for um, uh, served me well at that time. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's... Any kind of experiences like that? Yeah, I think that's the the big one has always been that, like, see where those new opportunities are, right? And say, hey, this is something that interests me. I see a gap there within either the studio, my team, the industry. And if you're passionate about it, then yeah, go for it. And you're going to find that even if you don't succeed at that thing, the things you will learn and the, the connections you've made with people could maybe, if that doesn't work out, are going to probably push you into another track as well. Yeah, and I think that... Um 
a lot of times, and, and partly why we wanted to talk about this, is we always talk about breaking into the industry for the first time and, and how you get into the industry. But like when you get to a studio and you've, uh, you, you've just gotten there, you're getting used to the culture and the process and the pipelines and the tools, you have your head down and you're not really thinking about where your career could go. Or maybe you're not even seeing the opportunities that are put in front of you uh, that you could have. So that, it, it's really about kind of lifting your head up, trying to see what those opportunities are sometimes and, and, and know when to actually take advantage of some of those. Um, I, I'm going to agree with that 100%. Like seeking opportunity is really important. I went to school kind of um, the same as Tasha. Like um, I was studying traditional animation. Um, and on the computers there, we had like a very small um, semester where we learned a bit of 3D, but not very much. And from there, I thought, hey, this is a perfect opportunity to really get into it because the program was there on the computer anyways. So take advantage of that and do your own studies and you never know where that can leave you. And now I'm in games. So without that, I don't think I'd be in games even. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was on a track on film for the first few years of my career. Um, and I, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to go into games as the rest of my career. I thought I was gonna go down the VFX route uh, possibly get into feature animated film, and it wasn't until I actually made the jump into games, um, and, and even then had one foot in, one foot out for a year, that uh, that I saw those opportunities in front. I saw how different it was in a game environment versus what I had just experienced for three years, and um, and I was able to kind of seize on some of those opportunities early and start to uh, understand like where my career could go. Whereas I think the first three years in film, I was like, man, I just got to get better. Everybody around me is so amazing, and I, I'm not even sure what is happening. I just know that I'm, I'm, I'm not very good right now. And so getting into games, it was like, no, you get to work with um, some engineers. You get to work with some programmers and designers to actually make systems and implement systems that will um, change the player's experience. Whereas, um, and, and I don't know that I, I, I saw those opportunities without actually getting into games first. Yeah. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm super excited that, to have you here, Tasha, because... Uh, like your like career trajectory is like super inspirational to me, and how it seems so sort of varied and like you started as an animator and moved through you've like sort of applied that to a bunch of different disciplines it seems like so how do you like moving from you know like senior like animator to senior animator I think is a little bit more of a traditional thing that that maybe people understand, but you've moved like tangentially a few times, right? And, and so how, how do you feel like that came about? Yeah, so um, this sort of uh, segues a little bit into my, into my next uh, career path, which is um, uh, I actually left Pixar after nine years as an animator there in feature and went to work at Double Fine um, in games. And um, I think that Part of what you were saying is like sort of at the beginning of your career, you're you're um, you're concentrating a lot on just just getting better. Yeah. And then um, at least I did after a while. I I felt like I was reaching a point where I don't know. I just felt like I hit a creative rut, and I'm sure that a lot of people here can relate to that sort of feeling. And I just felt like I needed to learn something new. And at a large company like Pixar, a lot of times you can be um, pigeonholed into your particular specialty. And so it doesn't give you a lot of opportunity to branch out and um, learn new things because you're, you, you become part of this, this machine that um, <laughs> is a well-run machine that's making movies. Um, but, uh, so I'm actually really glad that I went to a small company after that because it was a completely different experience. And um, I got the opportunity to learn modeling and rigging and um, animating the camera and animating, animating in games, which is a lot different than what yeah. I was doing in film. Yeah. And um, so that gave me a whole new set of skills that then... After five years, I left Double Fine and went back to Pixar. Then I was bringing this whole new set of skills with me, and I led a project at Double Fine, which, you know, it's a lot harder to do that at a bigger company. Um, and so then when I went back to Pixar, I was able to say, 
look, these are the different skill sets that I have now. And sometimes you might have to look around at other companies like, you know, where can I get these skills to grow my my skill set that I that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the time I had asked at Pixar, hey, I'm interested in learning rigging. And they were basically like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really need you to animate right now. So, um, and then that kind of led me to uh, that led me to learn a lot of Maya on my own and learn games animation on my own. And then working at Double Fine was able to learn that. Um, so it is interesting that sometimes you have to le look elsewhere. But then I ended up coming back to Pixar. So, so I would recommend. If you do look elsewhere, try not to burn any bridges like where you are, yeah. because you might end up going back or wanting to go back. Or um, when I when I went back to Pixar, I didn't want to work in feature anymore. So that was the other key thing of looking like what other positions using this skill set are available, and they happen to have a position in um, their legacy team, which is all their all their um, groups that are. Uh, they work on supporting the film, so it's not directly working on the film, but supporting it. So there's interactive, there's um, consumer products, there's theme parks, there's marketing, all these different groups. And to me, that sounded more interesting than working on features because I had already done that before, and this was something new, and it was just more interesting for me to be learning new things. Um, and so that's what I did. I was in the marketing group for a while, and um, then one of my friends left the theme parks group, and I was like, that sounds really fun. <laughs> and so I feel like my theme parks job now is like a combination of all these different skills that I've learned, and it, I'm working on a lot of multimedia kind of projects, and so my work in games really relates to that. Um, and, and yeah, that's where I am now. So I'm really happy with, with where I am now, but... That doesn't mean I'm done, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and I kind of feel like um, it's a perfect um, scenario for uh, us talking about opportunities and things that can develop w within a studio, right? So you could look for those opportunities in a studio, and they might not always be there for your career track advancement. So you may want to get to senior. You may want to get to a discipline lead role, but those things may not always exist. And even though you may love your company, you may love what you're doing, if you don't think about what you want for your career in five years or where you are currently, even if you are only in two years, and, and those opportunities are actually presenting themselves, it could actually hold your career back in the long run. And then those opportunities may not be there, you know, I feel, later on. They may, right? But yeah. you have to kind of recognize those things and, and try to figure out what you want to do for that career track, I think, as we, as we move forward. Yeah. I feel like that might segue into our next topic. Perfectly. Yeah. Are we yeah. good for time? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so our next topic is leaving jobs. And um, Tasha's, what you said really rings true to me because I've changed jobs recently. Um, and for me, it was really about wanting to learn a different skill set. Um, and uh, I was just really interested in what other companies were doing. And a little bit more about me was that uh, when I graduated from a traditional animation school, I joined Creative Assembly. And I had been there for six years, uh, going from junior to lead position. Uh, company was great. Um, I was really happy working there. I was r really almost feeling like people were looking up to me for the answers, and that was great. But um, at the same time, even though there was opportunity to explore the game as a lead and, and develop things like the animation combat systems there or the tools there, I, I felt like I wanted an opportunity to see what other studios were doing and to really broaden my horizon there. So that's why um, I made the decision to leave. Um, I joined Rocksteady, really enjoying it so far. And uh, that's kind of like my background to it. So uh, I kind of wanted to ask um, JP, like, yeah. w you know, what's kind of your experience? Because we've heard from Tasha. Sure, uh, so, sure. Yeah. And so um, coming out of school, I was lucky enough to, to get an internship. 
um, in film and uh, and kind of moving out to LA and, and experiencing that whole uh, craziness. And um, I grew up in a, in a in type of family where it's uh, you know. Uh, hard-working kind of union uh, mother and dad, the electrician and, and nurse, and um, and so I developed a sense of loyalty to your job. When you get there, it's, you're supposed to be loyal. So I, I moved out um, on a whim for like a four-month contract, and I'm like, if I work my ass off, um, they're going to give me a job, and I'm going to stay there. And like I was just naive, and I had no idea what was happening. So I, I worked my ass off. I, I thought I did pretty well, but uh, like every uh, VFX film, they bring on a ton of animation talent. And then it, when the project's over, they, they let a bunch of them go. So um, I was kind of let go, and, I, and, and it made me realize I had to switch gears and keep going and growing. Um, that, that made me um, really search out different opportunities than what my main goal was, which was film. So I, had the, I was in L.A. I was like, I need to, I need to like, make a living. So um, actually being able to go to another studio that picked me up working on games, um, and Rhythm called me back, and I had to make a, a, a tough decision at that point of, do I want to go back in the film? Do I want to be loyal? So it was like that, that, that situation that kind of creeped back in, and, and, um, and I ultimately made the decision to leave. I was honest with them. I had uh, conversations with them around it um, because they did want me to stay, but uh, I ultimately felt like I, I wanted to go back in the film. I thought that that was going to help, help me um, get my skills the best that, that I wanted to kind of uh, advance with. And then um, getting from there, it really wasn't about my career at that point. My, you know, uh, I had my wife to think about as, as at that point too. And, and, you know, she wanted to go back to college. And so I said, you know what, you've been moving around with me for, uh, for three years now. I uprooted your life. Like, you know, I, I want you to go back to school. I want you to be happy like I'm happy in my career. So sometimes I think those sacrifices and those opportunities present themselves in different ways than, than, than they would. Right. And so I, I, I started looking for jobs in areas where I knew she could get into schools and, um, and that kind of was the decision factor in where I started applying for jobs. Yes, I wanted to work at companies that I enjoyed and that I liked, but um, ultimately I made the sacrifice like she had done to, to leave um, the film industry and go into games, and it just it worked out because I love what I do. I love the company now, so um, it actually just worked out, but I, I took the risk. I took the opportunity to try to do that. Yeah. That's great. Like, I, I feel like I was on a similar... Um, half as that as uh, because uh, rock studies in London and my boyfriend actually lives in London so it kind of it was a tough decision because similar to you I had that loyalty I had a great team yeah. you know that's yeah, tough um, I cried on my last day yeah. like yeah. falling just because I I was connected with them and I would miss them so much um, because you you grow and you, you become yeah. like it's like a family yeah, absolutely almost, absolutely you have to think um not just about your career, but about your life yes, as well. Whenever you, you think about cha changing jobs, and yeah. Mike, uh, <laughs> if there's anybody that it's relevant to as well right now, yeah. So I, I just what three weeks ago started it at Bioware. So that was my my most recent job change. Um, that's my seventh studio in wow. twelve years, I think. Um, so wow. I've I've had a lot of experience leaving jobs um, and. Uh, there's obviously like always a bunch of different reasons, right? Like uh, how creatively satiated are you, right? How much opportunity do you have there? And whenever somebody kind of asks me, uh, when do I know it's the right time to leave my job? Uh, the way that I've kind of always boiled it down to is like, what is your frustration to excitement level on a daily basis, yeah. right? Like yeah. if, if you go into work, like every, every job you have is going to have some frustrations in it. There's gonna be some challenges with it. But are you still more likely to be excited than you are frustrated, right? And the way it kind of works for me is like, uh, as long as I'm always more excited, I'll deal with those frustrations as they come. And then usually you kind of get like that 50-50 balance where you kind of go, well, I'm not actively looking, but if a great opportunity shows up, I'm going to have, like, I'm going to be tempted to talk to them, right? Um, and then once you hit that point where that frustration level is, is out of whack, then that's usually when it's, it's time to go. Now, the, the caveat there for me has always been uh, you, need to, you need to be honest, though, about is that frustration something that uh, you or the 
like the person you directly report to can be fixed or can be mitigated, right? Yeah. Because I think yeah. a lot of times people just go, I'm frustrated, and maybe like that just eats them and they're done, right? But um, if you're at a place and you love the culture and you love the, the team that you have and you're frustrated, then like put that effort in up front to say, can I fix this? Let me try to address this, right? Because uh, if you can, like, it's just going to get better. Like, it, it's going to be this mix of uh, you don't have to move because moving sucks, right? And uh, you're going to get stronger there. You're going to get more opportunities there, right? Um, but if you get to a point where you're not empowered to fix those frustrations, yeah. then, yeah, you gotta, you got to bail, right? Because ultimately what's going to happen is, like, uh, we all have this creative battery inside of us that it's, like, only, uh, only we know how full that is and how much we can sort of give. And if you're hitting constant frustration that you can't fix or solve, that's just gonna drain your battery. And once your battery is drained, like yeah. getting that back is so hard. Yeah, and so hard. yeah, it's, it's so you kinda have to be honest with yourself about that, right? So, and, and it is hard, right? Like, uh, because yeah, every, every team is special and you grow with people that you, uh, that you love working with, right? And yeah. It's a lot of experience. Yeah. And, but the, the benefit is, like, I've now learned seven different workflows and seven different studio cultures and tons of amazing people. So, you know, it's not like you forget all of that and you maintain those relationships and those friendships. And well, and it seems like you've been to multiple studios um, and you've, you've succeeded at those studios as well. So it's not like you're not going to those studios and things aren't, you know, you're not putting in the hard work in and it doesn't seem like it's a good fit. It seems like each time that I talk to you and that you've been at a different studio, you're genuinely happy with where you are. So how is it that, you know, if you don't mind me asking, like, the transition into a new culture? Like, what, how is that feeling? Like, you've had to do it so many times, and it seems like to some success, obviously, because you've still been happy there. So sure. there's got to be some way to, that your, your, your mentality kind of going in there um, to, to think about, well, this is a little bit scary because I was really happy over here, or I had a great team or whatever, but now I'm going into a new culture. Like, what, what do I do now? Like, how do I... How do I even approach that? Yeah, so I think the first step is you uh, during the interview. Like, when you're interviewing with another company or with a, with a studio with a job, they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them just as much, yeah. right? Like, it's, yeah. it's good it, you know, if they're like, we're just going to hold you in a room the whole time, you don't get to see the studio, you don't get to see the show floor, you don't get to see, like, what people are working on, you don't get to sense that vibe, um, that's not going to work, right? Like, you need to, to understand because that's, where you're going to be. That's who you're going to be working with. Yeah, and it, is, there, is their company structure or culture the right fit for what you're looking for? Right, right. Because uh, even if you get excited about the project, like if you don't know what your day-to-day -day is going to be, then yeah. you can't, you're going into that, that frustration, excitement balance blind. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and that's just setting yourself up for failure. Um, and then I think the other is when you go into that, that new place, um, try and like drop all of that baggage, positive and negative, from the last place. Right, because uh, you're coming into some someplace new that has their own their own culture, their own approach to things. Some things are going to feel a little bit weird, and it's easy to go, "Well, this is different, so let me just say that it needs to be like how I had it before." Yeah, and it's like, "Well, don't like try to understand why they're doing those things this way." There probably are things you can bring in that they're not aware of or they didn't understand, but you need to sort of be a sponge for a while. Yeah, before you just start, you know telling everyone else. Yeah, no one's going to like that. <laughs> right, right. And, and I mean, that's, that's the big thing. And, and likewise, um, uh, make sure that when you leave that last place, you said, don't burn those bridges. And because you never know, they, somebody there might be working with you. Yeah, it's or a small somebody's industry. Or somebody's at the next place you want to go to. <laughs> exactly. And, remember, and the thing they always remember about you is like the last thing they worked with you on. Yeah. And if you are an amazing person there, but you put in your two weeks notice and then you slack off for those last two weeks, that is like the instant identifier to the character of a person, right? If as soon as they put it in and they're like, this is off me, and you see them just playing games for the last two weeks, everyone around them recognizes that, they remember that, and if they have another opportunity to work with them again, that's the thing that sticks in their head, right? So, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, and if, <laughs> uh, and being a lead on, on a project uh, being open to feedback and uh. actually we did something at Double Fine on, on my project Costume Quest that I felt like was a really um, positive thing for the team which was asking 
we did this anonymous survey, which at a small company, it's like, how anonymous can yeah. you really be? But um, we did like a survey in the middle of the project, sort of like how you do a postmortem at the end of a project, but it was in the middle. So we actually had the opportunity to make some changes in the middle of the project. And it is hard to hear some uh, feedback that could be construed as negative, but I felt like it was really, it's valuable to have that in the middle of a project rather than just at the end. But I was actually curious about your experience too, because I think you were saying that you were a lead at your previous company, but at your new company, um, you're not a lead. No. So how was that going from that, from that uh, lead position to a, a non-lead? Um, I'm actually quite enjoying it because uh, although I, I actually really love the organizational side of being a lead um, and the fact that I get to kind of foster the team, like just as a lead, I, I'm a support for them. Um, but I felt at that time um, I was falling a little bit out of touch with the craft. So now being able to join Rocksteady and be um, be able to ask those questions a lot more, um, I feel like I'm really dwelling in. I'm really, really enjoying it. So um, it's kind of like you say, like I just really wanted to learn a new skill set, and I have that opportunity now to to look up to someone. And at a new company, it's almost better to go in not as a lead because yeah. then you have a while to learn and work your way up yeah. into that position. Uh, at the time, they even like uh, uh, whenever uh, we were we were chatting, there was a lead position open. But I said to them, I don't know Unreal that well. Um, I don't feel comfortable then it, being a lead if I don't know all the processes. I won't be as the, the right person for that support. Um, as a senior, yeah, I can still support those around me, even if those around me are other seniors, because we always learn off each other. But um, being a lead, you know what, I, I want an opportunity to follow someone else's direction for a while, and then we can see what goes from there. So, yeah. yeah, should we move to yours? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah that that uh, segues um, kind of into, this all kind of ties together, so we're trying to make sure that um, each one segues into it, and I think we're pr at a pretty good spot now where we're going to be talking about negotiating. Um, and not a lot of people talk about this, I think, in general. My experiences in film in the past um, were very different than what games are. Games are, um, nobody talks about their salary. Nobody talks about what perks they get. Nobody really talks about any, any of that stuff. You talk with HR about that, right? Like, don't discuss that with me. Um, but in film, it was, it was very different. Um, LA was a, was a scene that um, there was a lot of freelance work um, and there was a lot of people moving in and out of jobs freely. So it was natural to say, hey, you know, what were you making over there? I, you know, I, I went out there with four friends. We all got the, the jobs together. So we were negotiating around the same time. So of course we talked about it. Everybody talked about it because part of the culture down there was nobody wanted to get taken advantage of either. And everybody was kind of looking out for each other. So in, able, in order to make sure that you're getting what you're worth, it might not have always worked out because I still may have been a shit negotiator. But like, in order to keep the, the, the playing field level and to get what you were worth, everybody was kind of chatting about it a little bit. Now, um, going into, into games, it's definitely a little bit more insular. It feels that way. Um, which is okay, because some people just are not comfortable talking about it. And that's okay, too. You know, if you have a good friend and you trust in them or you confide in them, even, um, you, know, you know, your lead typically will know around the range that you're making, around that for whatever promotions they're going to um, uh, put you in for. So um, if you have a good lead and you're open to talking about them, you, you, should, be, you should feel like um, you have the opportunity to do it. At least I, I try to um, give that to my team. Um, but there's, there's things that you can do to be a better negotiator, I think. A couple of them, and I, obviously I'd love to hear uh, you know, what you guys have because there's, there's a ton of experience here with that too. Um, not all my experiences have been good. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't just natural at it. They didn't talk to me about it in, in college. I didn't, um, I didn't negotiate my first um, you know, paper job. I didn't negotiate when I was you know, bartending. Right? It was like I learned how to talk to people, but 
and maybe I got a better tip that way, but, yep. um, but there's pay ranges and, and do your research, you know, there's ranges, uh, and at Activision, there's a range per, um, uh, per level that you go and you can either be at the bottom of that range in the middle of that range or at the top of that range. And there's, there's, um, some crossover in the ranges too, before you actually get promoted. But, um, you have to know what those ranges are and know what your experience is. So that way, when you start to negotiate, I feel that you can, you can be accurate in, in hitting that range up or down, right? Um, so part of that for me is just um, doing a lot of research. There's a lot out there on the internet now. Some of it is, uh, can be misleading, I think, but there's enough people, if you know them in the industry, reach out and just say, hey, like if you have a mentor, am I, am I shortchanging myself? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. It's you true. Know? Some people are might be uncomfortable to tell you exactly how much money they're yeah, making, but yeah. they might be more comfortable to say a range. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of times I found if I give a range, the top of the range is something that maybe you overshoot a little bit, right? But the bottom of the range is something that you need to be comfortable with too. So if they come back down to you and, and, and give you that bottom range and you were already okay with that, then you need to be, that, then that's great, right? But if you, if you give them a range and they hit somewhere in that range, you're going to be much happier than them just bringing it down. And then you're like, oh, man, I didn't negotiate. I just took it. And now I'm like, what am I going to do, right? Yeah. So um, that, those, are, those are a few things anyway. Yeah, and also looking where the company's located and what their, uh, yeah. you know, uh, what do they say, cost of living yeah. is in that area. That's a big, that's a big factor in it. Um, you know, and, and to that point, too, is um, uh, being happy after that. So find out where you're moving to, find out the cost of living, find out how much it's going to take you to live there and to be comfortable and to be happy. And that's what you should be trying to aim for. Because if you get to a place and you've undershot yourself and you find that you can't even go to the grocery store and get the proper things that you're not going to be happy, then you're not going to be happy at work. And then, like, it's going to be a death spiral and, and w like... I, I don't, you know, I want you to be happy if, if I'm on your team, you know, and if it's about money, then like, let's talk about it. You know, even at my studio, we, we, we really don't want people to leave for money. Like if out of anything, we do not want you to leave because we are not paying you enough. That's something that can be so easily fixed yeah. in reality, right? Yes. Like it's just, yeah. But again, like people are very uncomfortable bringing it up. Maybe they're uncomfortable talking about it with their peers, but also they're, they may be uncomfortable bringing it up to their leads. And I, and I feel if I foster an environment where my team can feel comfortable to talk to me about anything, then I can go to bat for them too. And I can, you know, we can work on their reviews. We can work on getting them on, uh, above target or on target. And then, you know, I can lay the case for them so that way when they get bumped up to the next one, then, then great, like, let's talk about their, their living wage. Let's talk about, like, making them more comfortable and happy here because I want to invest in them as a good team member. Yep. And, and, and that's only going to make our, our studio stronger. It's going to make people happier. It's going to make my team better. It's going to make the work better. So, you know, there's ways I think that you can go about it to not shortchange yourself. I, I feel like it's important kind of segueing from the previous panel um, with yeah. imposter syndrome. Yeah really knowing your worth and we i feel like we tend to kind of lowball ourselves so um i feel like it could be even to practice it a struggle yeah. when you go to a restaurant and you get served something that's not right <laughs> to to even challenge yourself but even challenge like the situation saying like well this wasn't right could i have that so asking is pretty important because yeah. if you never ask, you never know, right? That's so right. that's a great um, example. Yeah, and it, and it can give people that ability to get more comfortable with negotiating um, in the workplace <laughs> if they negotiate outside of the workplace. Yeah, I, I've been to plenty of places uh, where um, uh, you know I've been, and my wife is not happy with the food, and I get very uncomfortable when she says, um, "Sir, can you come over here?" And I'm like, um, "Are we going to have this conversation? Is this, <laughs> this really what's going to happen right now?" And she just she goes for it, and I got to give her credit for it, you know, like because usually I'll just suffer through it, and I'll be like, "Oh, yep, uh, uh, yep, that was that was all right, but what, whatever, you know." But uh, you're right; it's a great example of like getting outside of your comfort zone, and if you find things like that in your daily life where you don't have to be mean about it, you know what I'm saying? But if you get outside of your comfort zone, 
You know, that's a, it's a great example. Yeah. I, I even had an experience like here just on a Sunday. We were, we were out for lunch and the waiters took a while. Yeah. And um, the, t the tea went cold. And like this was like at an expensive tea place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we were waiting for, for the food. The tea went cold. So I just mentioned it. You know, well, the tea's gone cold. She said, no problem. I'll bring you a new one. You know, it, it's not like. I was forceful about it. It's nothing like that. Yeah. You just make a comment. You say, well, you know, I'm paying for the service. I'm here, you know, and I have a certain expectation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was with a party that was looking at me like, did she, <laughs> yeah, did she really do that? But I know. it was, you know, because they weren't, they weren't maybe used to yeah, it. Yeah. It, it's fine. And yes, if so, if, it is fine. You know, it's, it's okay to make a comment. If they don't accommodate yep. you, that's yep. fine. Maybe you can ask. Yeah. But if they say, I'm sorry, then. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. And, and to that point, like. Oh, it's probably not going to go as bad as you're imagining. Yeah. In your yeah. Head. yeah. And, and to that point, like, if. Um, if an individual on my team um, comes to me and talks to me about they're struggling with money or they need a little bit more, then I can work with the, the, with the managers that are doing the raises every year to say, like, are they at the low range? Are, are they at the low part of the range? Is there something that we can do to bump them up? Because it's not unheard of to get bumped up a little bit higher within your range, even if you're not, like, crossing over into the next range without getting promoted, right? And I, I think as, like, a worker yourself, you can ask, like, well... If I take on more responsibility, Absolutely. could this be a possibility? Yeah. So it's not like you're just demanding something. That, you can say, well, you know, how can I give more value yeah. so that I can get more value? That, that's right. That's, that's a great point. The, uh, probably the best one that I, that I ever heard that I, once I started doing it, it made a big difference was, this is from Simon Unger. Shout out. I think he's in the chat right now. It's Anim State. But uh, <laughs> Simon's tip was, do not be the first person to give a number, right? Like... Uh, the people you're negotiating with, they see salaries all the time. They're used to yes. playing with numbers a lot larger than we are. Yep. Right? So uh, if you say, I would like, can I get a signing bonus? Don't say, can I get a signing bonus of this? Yeah. Because, you know, I've done it before in my head where I'm like, oh, can I get this thing? And in my head, I'm like, I want like this. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back, that's totally reasonable. And they'll offer me double what I was thinking. Yeah. And you're like, I'm so glad I didn't, like, once I started wheeling it back, I was like, because if, and if they give you a number that you're not happy with, right? Yeah. You can just say, hmm, interesting. And then don't say anything. Yeah. Right? Just, and it's going to be awkward, right? Usually those conversations right. are awkward. Because they're thinking in ranges, like yeah. you said, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and they're coming here, and they know how far they can push it. Yep. And if, if it comes back and they go, they're like, they'll, they'll tell you, look, we have this range, this is at the, the high point of it. We can't do that within this title. Yeah. Then you're going to get to that conversation with them. Yeah. But yeah, let, let them, it's, it's like, Good tip. it's like, you know, yeah. buying a car, right? Yeah. Like yeah. the first person to say a number loses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that, um, uh, you know, I think most larger studios nowadays, they, they've been through it kind of the ringer. And so I don't think that most studios in my experience, you know, uh, most of what I'm, I'm talking about has been from my experience, but um, they don't want to be dishonest with you. They're not going to, you know, they, they'd much rather um, give you what the industry standard looks like um, than have bad press uh, on, their, on their names. Yeah. So they're not going to just come in and, and lowball you, uh, you know, all you want. Now, it, it is different because if you're going to a larger studio that has money, obviously they have the money to pay you, but if you're going to go to an indie studio or startup, not that I have a ton of experience in that, but a lot of friends... Um, they may not have the same range. They may not have the same uh, cash flow to actually offer you what you normally would get paid at a higher studio. So you also have to understand that. Yeah. But you can, you can make that choice. Sure. Absolutely. Right? Am I going to be happier or more excited doing this thing? And I'm, absolutely. I'm cool taking this, this pay cut for it, but yes. you're being honest again with yourself. That, that's exactly right. And I think part of it is all being honest with yourself. Part of that is like being out of your comfort zone, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. Yeah. It's not easy to go in and negotiate. It's not easily um, to say, I want to advance my career and how do I do that, right? Um, it's not easy to leave a job and go into a new culture. So a lot of those, these things are very, uh, very much things that are uncomfortable, especially for um, an industry uh, like, like gaming where it, um, it can be very singular, yep. especially when you get to your own thing. It, there's a lot of emphasis around teamwork and how do we work together to get the game out there, but then everybody forgets about what, what actually is important here too yep. for your own self. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, for me, uh, um, I, I think that uh, those are 
those are have been my experiences. Um, uh, jumping around to the studios can help you um, in that too. Um, with your experience, your rate tends to go up. In my experience, a little bit faster as you as you um, leave a studio, go to a new studio, come back to a studio, whatever it is that you want there. I mean, not astronomical, right? But like, yeah. it can bump up a little bit here and there. So yeah. there there is that experience, and, um, and and sometimes that can that can help. Yeah, and it's it's also. Uh, my first uh, first job I ever worked at was for a startup, and uh, they offered a completion bonus, right? Yeah. And it was like, okay, this is a startup. Like most startups are not gonna succeed. There's a good chance this could fail, and it won't be like it won't complete. So that completion bonus, I'm gambling that I will probably never see this money. Yeah. So I said, hey, uh, instead of a completion bonus, can you roll that into my salary, right? Because uh, if if the game is complete, like gets out there, and I'm still getting it, yeah. but I'm getting like a little bit of it now all the time, and that's helping my my general. And they're like, yeah, that's totally reasonable. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yeah. So thinking about stuff that way can can also benefit you. Well, and um, and and I just thought of another one um, is um, bonuses in general, right? Like uh, you may be negotiating, and they may talk to you about bonuses. Um, but don't ever think, or, or in, in my opinion, you shouldn't roll that into your salary. Yeah. You know, because bonuses are what they are. It's a bonus. It is not a guaranteed money. So you shouldn't ever be really ro rolling that into what your overall salary uh, of life is. Because what if those bonuses stop? What if they're not there? Can you then live off the salary that you, neg you negotiated with bonuses and, and the factor? So um, you, you shouldn't really be looking. You, it should be thought of as a bonus because that's what it is. If you get them, cool. If you don't, then at least you know you can still be comfortable and live with, with what your wage is. That's good. Yeah, I think we, I mean. All right, we want to transition there. Yeah. One. Should we? All right, All right. So the 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 last topic we have, and I know we've been getting a lot of questions, and, and Lindsay's got a uh, paper airplane to toss at us. So we'll get through this this last point, and then uh, we'll start digging into all of these yeah. awesome questions we've been getting. But uh, becoming elite, right? I think that's sort of uh, a a big one uh, that uh, people kind of have a certain point where they get offered a lead, or they think maybe they want to become a lead but uh, they're not sure how to. And a lot of studios don't have a great training process. Uh, and a lot of it seems to come from uh, learning through mistakes, right? And so I think we had like uh, two talks yesterday at the boot camp, uh, one a micro talk by Jason Schum and the other one, uh, uh, Nick Shalano from Blizzard, who did a talk about becoming a lead. And uh, a lot of it was saying like, I failed miserably. I became a lead and I thought that meant I had to be the best animator on the team. And the number one thing to keep in mind when you become a lead is that uh, it is no longer about you, it is about the team. It is a 100% support role. Uh, if you uh, want to become a lead because uh, you think it will give you more power, it will allow you to make more decisions, it will let you take the shots or the animations that you most want to do, then you do not want to be a lead. You will not make a good lead. You will fail and everyone will hate you. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just honest, right? Like, you yeah. literally become, like, uh, lead is the shit umbrella, is, yeah. is, is honestly what it is. <laughs> like, that's, your job is to protect and foster the rest of your team, yeah. uh, 100%. And uh, I think that's one of those things that's, that's hard because again, you just, a, a position opens up and they go, oh, you're senior, you're really good, you understand gameplay stuff, you understand some nice, whatever, boom, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, we, I talked a little bit about this last night in the sense of like um, a lot of uh, jobs that I've been at or, or leads that I've experienced, not necessarily just in games either, right? This is probably applicable to most things um, in, a, in, a, in a structure that has a hierarchy to it, right? Is they, a lot of companies will see this person as the best at what they are and then they're like, you should be the lead of that. Yeah. But that person is not necessarily a good leader for people. Right. They may be great at what they do, but it doesn't mean that that translates into, I am a good lead to yeah. manage other people's lives and their careers. Yeah. One of the things that I respect more than anything is when you have a senior employee, a senior person, and when said, oh, do you want to become a lead? They say no, right? Like that is, that is someone who is completely aware of 
what they're interested in doing, they understand what the job is, right? And, and that is so incredibly, so incredibly important. Yeah. Uh, because again, like they're just, it's not gonna work out yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, and I, well, I think it's okay also, you know, if you do want to become a lead, uh, if you do realize like, okay, that means most of my day is gonna be sitting in meetings, but if you do realize that is what I want to do. And for me, like, I actually like doing that. I feel like it, I don't, I am not at a place in my career where I want to be sitting at my desk doing animation all day. Like, to me, it's more interesting for me to go from project to project to project to project yeah. and having that sort of multitasking going on all the time. For me, that's challenging. And so that's what I do like about what I'm doing now. And, and being a lead, I think, is a lot of juggling different things and yeah. constantly like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know being flexible that way. And so if that is something that you find challenging and you want to do is is saying, yes, I do want to be a lead, but then you know figuring out like how do I, how do, I do that? How do I increase those skills? Um, I wanted to mention a talk that I saw at GDC a while ago that um, Brian Sharp did. I think he's at Oculus now. I don't want to get that wrong, but, <laughs> um, and it was called Concrete Steps to Being a Better Leader, and I just remember it, and, and look it up, because I think it's on the vault, so I think people can access it, but that was a really, really good talk, and it, it was about empathy, which I think is not discussed a lot in leadership, but yeah. is a really uh, important quality to have if you yeah. want to be a lead. It's a, like, with all this stuff, right, it's like that honest self-reflection, yeah. and the biggest thing is, uh, what do you want out of, like, what, what have you wanted out of your leads? What were the things that you loved about a lead? What were the things that drove you nuts? If it was, I could, uh, they never seemed to be available to me. They always seemed sort of frustrated. You never get to have a bad day when you're a lead, right? It's, it's the same thing as like, uh, like, you know, tech artists and stuff, right? Like, people are coming to you because they have a problem. Uh, if you're having like issues outside of work, you came in, your car broke down, it was raining, somebody sprayed you with mud as they drove by, right? Like, when you come in, like you have to sort of drop all of that because everyone there needs you to help them, right? And uh, your mood totally... Your mood like radiates down into the rest of the team. Right, because if you come in frustrated and somebody says, hey, I'm having this problem with this, with this task and you're frustrated about it, they're going to get frustrated. And chances are they're already frustrated about it because they came to you. And as it is, you hate having to go to your lead and say... I don't know how to do this thing, I'm having a problem, right? And so if they respond, it's just, it's just a spiral, right? So you don't, and, and all of this stuff is, is not easy and it, yeah. it wears on you, right? And so finding that another lead or another confidant in the studio that when you are frustrated, you can go into a room with them and like, cause you gotta, go. you gotta shake that gotta sh shit go. umbrella off sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So like you, you need to find someone or a room that you can like shake that off on and it it's, might be your manager, it might be your lead, it might be, you know, just another lead that you work with. It could be someone that's senior on your team that you have a really good relationship with yeah. and you know that it's not gonna leave that room and it won't push off on them. Um, yeah. Finding, men finding a mentor that you can really, you can, you can vent with. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because all that goes downhill. So you have to be able to compose yourself and be very self-aware of what you're doing in the environment because that, that is going to pr be projected onto yep. your team. Absolutely. There's not a day goes by that I probably don't get frustrated by something, but it, it doesn't mean that I go into the team room at my desk and throw a fit in front of everybody. Yeah. I'll do that with my, my boss in another room, like you said, uh, away from them. So none of that stuff actually rolls downhill. Yeah. You have to be very self-aware. And uh, for me, um, whenever I would come in every day, I would ask myself, how could I be more engaging today? Because that's what I enjoyed seeing in a lead. Yeah. That's what I valued is like, as someone who comes into a place and wants to learn and wants to grow and develop, um, to have someone there that I feel comfortable engaging yeah. with, um, it's just so important. So for me, it's, it's so re rewarding to watch every one of my team members, whenever I was lead, like see everyone, see their strengths, their weaknesses, give them things that they're comfortable with, that they can really use their strengths to, but then also in between the things that they were comfortable with, 
give them things that they were uncomfortable with, just to watch them kind of um, see how they can tackle it. Yeah, challenge Make, them. You know, challenge them, yeah. watch them grow, be that be that support for them. Mm -hmm. And then after they're like, oh, that was really hard, give them the thing that they're comfortable with again so they have a little bit of time to, you know, recalibrate. <laughs> so. Well, and I think that being is. consistent too, like um, I think being a, a consistent lead, somebody that that your team knows what to expect from you. Like if I come in and my attitude is completely different each day, like they're not gonna know which way to go w with me. But if I have a consistent idea and structure, they understand um, you know, where we're going, what, what uh, my vision is, a lot of uh, what I expect from them. Like I can't just expect them to guess at what that is and then hold them accountable for that. I have to be, I have to kind of set that standard and I also have to be very consistent in what I do. Um, otherwise, it's just gonna throw the whole dynamic off and it's just gonna lead to a little bit more chaos. So I think before we get to that, I had two other quick notes about yeah. Lean. One uh, that seems to happen a lot is that people feel like when they're lead, they have to have an answer for everything. Yeah. That is false. You do is not false. need to have an answer yes. for everything. You need to be able to say, I don't know, but I will find you an answer. Yes. And so then your job becomes finding where answers lie, not being the one that's always giving it, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a huge one. The other one is that... Uh, uh, you need to share the dreams of your of your team, right? Like, I could wish, right? Like, if 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 I was working with like JP, right? And I'm like, I think JP could be a fantastic technical animator, right? And I I feel like I see that that's in him, but he's like, no, I want to I want to like keep working on cinematics. I yeah. want to become the best traditional animator possible. Right. I can't force my dream on you. That's right. I have to share your dream mm -hmm. and help push that. Try right? to find opportunities for that. Right, exactly, yeah. right? And yeah. I think those, and so a lot of issues I ran into was uh, you might have people that you can see, like, there's so much great potential in them, but if they're not living up to it, it's your job to try and unlock that, but at a certain point, when are you dreaming for them more than they're dreaming for themselves? It's true. And you have to be honest with yourself and them and know when it's like, I'm elevating this to somebody else because I this isn't this isn't working. Right? Yeah. yeah. I just quickly wanted to add to what you're saying. You don't always have to have an answer for something. Is I also think it's important for a lead to not always have to feel like they have to give a note on something. Yeah. Because a lot of times, um, I feel like it's really good for team morale for your team to feel like they have ownership, mm -hmm. and if you're always feeling like you're giving notes on every single thing, even if you know they think they're finished with it then they're going to feel micromanaged and like they're basically just like your puppet yeah. <laughs> so i think it's important to know um you know when to give a note and maybe when to just not you know not give a note you can let some things go sometimes you yeah. know if it's not the the perfect way that you imagined it yeah. you know? or the way you would have done it right yeah. the way that you would have done it right yeah. well and i feel if you micromanage like that takes you away from things that you could be doing to help better the project, better the, the team environment, everything. Like it is a lot of wear and tear on, on an individual if you are micromanaging somebody else. It's hard enough to manage your own self, right? And, and at all the little quirks and things that you wanna get done. But if, if you're getting in and micromanaging six people below you, like you're gonna, you're gonna get drained. It's not gonna be a good positive experience and you are not gonna then have potential as a lead to expand your horizons, expand the department, expand the vision of whatever the project is, right? So. Right, like making sure the, the bigger picture is taken care of. Yeah, yeah. All right, do we wanna, can you toss us the, some, all right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. There's an airplane that's flying around the room. It's fantastic. No, that's great. All right, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Oh, you want to read? All right, I can read. All right. All right, here we go. Okay, so a bag of candy asked, were there any major revelations you had while starting in the history that helped you to progress? The industry. What did I say? The history. History? Words are... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the industry. Was there... Was it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any ma major revelations you had while starting in the industry 
that helped you progress? Somebody want to take that? Uh, I think probably the biggest one I had was when I wanted to move up to senior was looking at what was like, I thought that the traditional thing of senior was I just had to become the best animator in the studio. And it was like prison rules. If I wasn't the best, then I just had to take down the best, right? Yeah. And that wasn't the reality because when you kind of step back and look at the seniors at studios, you have some that are really great animators. You have some that are really uh, great at implementing stuff. Yeah. And so for me, it became a, like the, it was like, oh, wait, where is there a gap? I don't need to be better than that person. I yeah. need to be filling a, a gap that doesn't already exist here. And, mm -hmm. and once I was able to start to sort of uh, look at the gaps between roles versus what I thought a role was, that yeah. like paradigm shift, everything became available. You know? Well, and I think uh, in film, I was really focused on just being the best animator that I could be, and that was okay. That was expected. That's what you're supposed to do. But when I got to, um, to games and I needed other uh, people around me to help support any initiatives that I wanted to go, um, it, 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 I had to go to them and talk to them about these initiatives to try to get buy-in, to try to get um, resources to help me build these systems that were going to make the, 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 the cinematics better or the content better or whatever it was that I was working. It wasn't just me and, and me trying to get better. I actually had to incorporate a whole uh, group of, of individuals that were also bought into the idea that, that this was going to help um, the quality or further... Um, the objective of what we were actually going after. So that was a pretty big revelation for me, I think. Uh, for me, the revelation was to be proactive more so than anything. Um, not sit around and like wait for someone to tell me what to do. Yeah. It was finding things to do and to help with. Um, really helped me in my career. Yeah, I would have to agree with that is yeah, being proactive. That's yeah. like, yeah. It's really important. And if, if the position that you want doesn't exist at the studio you're at, you know, find someone to talk to about it and yep. see if you can make it happen. Yeah. Yep. Uh, actually, that leads perfect into the next question from uh, at sizzle182. Should you ask for a promotion or wait for it to happen? That's well, a, what we were just question. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question because a lot of times when we, when we talk about um, in terms of promotions at my studio, um, uh, I'm working with my team members uh, each year in, in, in my one-on-ones, and we try to lay out the path of where they want to go in a year, in two years, and three years. And so that way, as, as they accomplish these things, and if I can support them in any, any way to do that, great. Um, but as they accomplish these things, we can get into their reviews, we can make it official. And so by the time a year or, or so goes by, or two years, and they're ready for promotion, it's just a, a book that I have to present to um, uh, management, and, and, and they're not going to they're not going to question it. It's it's my job to to really help them to to do that. But I I would say that a great way to to make sure that that's going to happen is to look above your pay grade, um, and and what the qualifications of that job list are, and try to punch above that in a consistent manner over a long period of stretch, so that when you get promoted, people are already like, whoa, he's they're not a senior yet, like. Yeah. If, if you have people already asking that in the studio, then your chances of getting promoted are like, they're there. So if you're already uh, uh, looking at what's above uh, your level and, and trying to punch towards that on a consistent basis, it's going to make it real easy. Yeah. yeah, so it's not, I guess it's just not necessarily just asking for a promotion, but yep. asking about what does it take to get to Absolutely. this particular position and yeah. the concrete steps. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also important too that sometimes this will come up when you're negotiating for the next job. So you may go to a studio and you may, you know, I know what happened a few times for me where it's like, I feel like coming in, I'm, I'm on a senior path. Uh, I want to be senior. So if maybe the salary or whatever wasn't as high, it was, okay, uh, if I need to get into the next range yep. and that requires being senior, negotiate that. Okay, I want to be honestly able to hit senior in the next year. So let's, let's lay out right from the get-go what that will take yep. so that if I meet those things, I know I can get, I've sort of negotiated that promotion into, into the beginning of it. That conversation started early so that both your manager and your lead and all of those people are, are aware of it and you have a concrete set of goals because if you meet those and it still doesn't happen, then that kind of gives you pause of, well, 
how long should I be here if yeah, they're not right. respecting these, these sort right. of goals, right? So yep. um, I, think, I think that's a huge part hold of it. Hold them accountable too, because yeah. that, if you don't hold them accountable, you know, yeah. and, they're, and, they're, and they're able to, to, to not follow through on what that is, what does that actually say about where you are? Yep. Is, you should rethink your options and whether or not that is the place for you. Yeah. I think we're, we're pretty close. I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So uh, up there, you can get in touch with any of us if you have any additional questions. Uh, and uh, thank you all so much for, uh, for watching. And we're going to toss it over to uh, Tim and Alexis. Thanks, hey guys. guys.